Welcome to the Moffitt Method Podcast, where longtime strength conditioning coach Tommy Moffitt explores everything from the art of coaching, improving performance, sports nutrition, and mental training. Now, welcome your host, Coach Tommy Moffitt. Welcome to the Moffitt Method Podcast. If you're listening for the first time, please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast and share it with your friends. Before we get to today's guest, I would like to take a moment to talk about the Moffitt Method training program and what we really do. At the Moffitt Method, we offer a remote coaching solution for your school, sport organization, and any individual team. If you're interested or know of someone who may be interested, please contact us via our website, themoffittmethod.fit, or email us at info themoffittmethod.fit for more information. Our amazing guest today is Coach Steve Englehart from the University of Colorado in Boulder, Colorado. Coach Englehart is going into his eighth season as the strength and conditioning coach for men's basketball in his 12th season overall at Colorado. His duties expanded to the Director of Strength and Conditioning for Olympic Sports in July of 2018. Coach holds certifications with the NSCA, USA Weightlifting, FMS, and TPI Level 1 and 2. Coach Englehart came to Colorado from Southern Miss University, where he worked for one year as assistant strength and conditioning coach for the Mustangs. That followed one season as the head football strength coach at Portland State University. Coach Englehart got his start in the business as a graduate assistant at the University of Hawaii. While at Hawaii, Coach earned his master's degree in kinesiology and rehabilitation science in the spring of 2009. He received his bachelor's degree in exercise science from Southeastern University in 2005. His twin brother, Chad, is the head strength coach for the Washington Commanders of the NFL. Coach is from the North Shore of Lake Pontchartrain and the city of New Orleans. He is married to the former Laura Williams, and the couple have three children, Braylon, Cora Lee, and Magnolia. Welcome to the podcast, Coach. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me, Coach. Yeah, I'm super excited about this. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I've, I've wanted to get uh, some coaches – on the show other than football string coaches um, because our program is not a football only program. We serve as all sports. And I think it's important that uh, we have coaches, uh, you know, that represent all of the sports that young men and young women play. So I appreciate you coming on here today. Uh, I, I'm honored to be on here, coach. Good. All right. So let's get to it, man. And uh, I want to start with how you got into the field of strength and conditioning. And, you know, can you tell us who were some of your early influences? And at this point in your career, what do you consider your biggest reward from our profession? Yeah, uh, great question. I think uh, how I got started in this field, me and my twin brother, uh, Chad, he's the head strength coach for the Washington Commanders. We used to uh, we used to sneak in this place called Pelican Athletic Club, and uh, and there's a guy named Kurt Hester there. Uh, we we did end up uh, starting to pay there, but in the beginning we didn't have enough <laughs> money, so we could just sneak in. Um, but uh, uh, Kurt was a strength coach there, and when I found out you could make money being a strength and conditioning coach, and we love to lift, I was like, wait a second. You can make money doing this. He's like, yeah. I said, oh, I want to do this. So then we started working with Kurt, and uh, you know, he was a great influence in my career. And uh, by far, he was. Uh, he had some energy. He loved the coach. He showed you how to get your voice. Uh, he he told. He showed you about passion. Uh, he was a big, big influence in my career. And uh, another guy named Tommy Heffernan at the University of Hawaii. Another big, big influence on my career. Uh, huge, actually. Uh, that dude gets it. Uh, if you don't know Tommy uh, Heffernan, you, you might want to get to know him. He's a great coach, but even better man. Um, yeah, we talked about. I think my him biggest. Last... I think my. Yeah. 
Go ahead. Go ahead. I, and I, I think my biggest reward right now, I mean, listen, if, if you're in this field, it, you you starting to realize when you get uh, when you have years of experience in this, it's it's easy to get these guys bigger, stronger, faster. Right. It's it's to, that that's the easy part, uh, in my opinion. Uh, I think the biggest reward is uh, after their careers. Right. How to help them as men. That that's hundred percent my my biggest reward. Going to their weddings, getting pictures of their kids. That's it. Yeah, um, yeah, that's that's huge, and uh, that is something uh, that I've enjoyed since I've I'm not coaching anymore. It's still having relationships with guys that you coached ten years ago or twenty years ago, and even further. Um, I was at, um, I was in New Orleans a couple of days ago and I went by John Curtis. Uh, I just wanted to go by JC and say hello to everybody. And when I pulled up, they were actually practicing, uh, out there, go figure that, huh? And, uh, oh, wow. they were out there <laughs> practicing and I walked out on the field and I see this guy walking toward me. And I, I didn't have my glasses on, so I, I kind of stared at him for a second. And it was a guy named Kevin Beard who played wide receiver for us at the University of Miami. And he is coaching wide oh, receivers wow. now at the University of uh, Miami. And we stood there. Neither one of us watched practice for about 30 minutes and had the greatest conversation. And I haven't seen him personally, I don't think probably in 15 or 20 years or so, uh, since I le- at least uh, 20 years. And so it was great to be able to see that guy. And, you know, when you go back, whether it's you seeing Kurt or Coach Heffernan or one of your former players, it's always – like you just saw him yesterday, you know, because of that bond yes. that you develop. Uh, so that was cool. Yeah. Um, having some solid, they, but coaching they never job. forget. Yeah. Oh no, they never forget. No, never forget that. They never forget what you made them do. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. You, yeah. Do you remember when? Yeah. Always get that. Uh, so you, you've had some solid coaching jobs and phenomenal experiences from the time, you know, you started training with Kurt until now. Uh, what makes uh, the Colorado men's basketball program different than some of the other places that you've worked at? I think it starts with uh... – I think I think what makes Colorado basketball different it starts with the, the head guy. It starts with Coach Boyle. Uh, coach Boyle is a very he's an elite coach, and he wants uh, he wants us to be elite, and he holds us to a high, very high standard. Um, I mean, you, when you go to meetings with him, you better have your t- t's crossed, eyes dotted. You better have everything in line, and uh, and he makes you a better coach for that. He makes the the staff better. He makes the players better. Um, he's big on, you know, making sure that ha- you make your habits and your habits don't make you. And that goes for all of us, you know, not only the players, but also the coaches. Uh, and he does a, a phenomenal job uh, with his staff as well as uh, with the with the players. But he, he's the one that makes the difference. man. he, he it's from that. It's from that. It's from the head guy. And when it trickles down to the assistant coaches like Coach Ron, Coach Greer, Coach Rick Ray, uh, I'm telling you right now, couldn't get a better staff. And, you know, they they keep you at a high standard, too. They they communicate very well when recruits are coming in. They, they communicate on what uh, certain guys need. And I think anywhere at a program, communication is key. Without communication, you are going to fail. I don't care what business you are in. Uh, you will fail if you don't have communication. And what we have here is great communication. Uh, with Adobo as well, Bill Carton and Zach Rubison. Uh, those guys, if I can't get to a meeting because I'm training some guys, uh, you know, we have a lot of different groups for basketball. 
So if I can't get to a coach's meeting, they write down the notes, they give it to me, and they say, hey, coach, let's make sure you have this for next meeting. And I think that's where this 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 is very, you know, like a pro level of how we organize here at the University of Colorado for men's basketball. Yeah. Um, you know, I've I've heard coaches complain. I'm talking strength coaches complain about head coaches having their thumb on the pulse of the program and and um Sometimes they call it micromanaging uh, the departments and stuff. But as a professional, I always liked that better than a coach that was kind of laissez-faire and hands-off. Um, because I, as a, uh, as a coach, I liked that organization. And I liked that level of communication and when the coach says, I want you to do this, or I think that is good, but can we look at it, look at doing it differently? I always like that myself personally. And it sounds like uh, that you have a similar relationship with uh, your head football coach. And, and I'm sure uh, the athletic director there, has influence in the program as well uh, or the administration because without their help, it makes it difficult a lot of times to get things done. Um, how, how, how is your relationship with the administration there and, you know, how, how have they been able to help you do your job? Administration is huge at the University of Colorado. And again, it starts with Rick George, the head athletic director. Uh, he, he, he believes in, you know, strength conditioning. He believes in mental health. He, he believes in our dietitians. He believes in our athletic trainers. And I think, and he puts a lot of money towards uh, strength conditioning, athletic trainers, our dietitian, our mental health. He finds a lot of money. He, he goes out and, uh, you know, go, talks to donors, fundraises. And I think when you have a guy like Rick George that believes in what you do, and he can see the plan when you talk to him. Again, he's a businessman, so you better have your uh, everything T's crossed, I's dotted. I won't forget the first time I had a meeting with him. He's a money. He's I mean, he's the AD. Yeah. And I'm like, yo, you know, this is what we need for men's basketball. I want eight racks. I want these racks. And he starts busting out the numbers. And he's like, it should be this. And I'm like, what? Uh, I, I need to go back. Coach, I, I went to public school in Louisiana. Let me go back and, uh, and get this done. <laughs> So uh, it was it was funny. He was laughing at me. I was like, how did you do that without a calculator? And uh, <laughs> he's like, I've been doing this my whole life. And uh, so I think uh, when when Rick George, uh, you know, believes in what you do, uh, he's going to make it happen. And our weight room here at the University of Colorado for men's women's basketball, women's volleyball and lacrosse is unbelievable. It's state of the art. We have everything you can think of in here from recovery to we got a basketball goal in here with the key. We have. Everything, force plates, Nord boards, you name it, we got it. And it starts with Rick George and it trickles down to our head uh, administration for sports performance, Miguel Ruda. He oversees everything, right? Everything sports performance wise from mental health to dietitians to athletic trainers to, uh, to strength conditioning. And the good thing about Miguel and Rick, they, you know, if they feel like you can do your job when you have meetings with them, they're going to respect what you say and you got to earn it. And, you know, I earned everything I got here. And it was hard work, but I earned it. So now when we go into meetings with them and we say, hey, we can't, you know, we should be looking into this. Uh, they listen to you and and they, then you have other meetings and then you get what you need done. And I think with, with those people uh, that we have uh, at the top of the administration is great. But nothing goes through. Everything goes through Tab Boyle, too, now. And I think uh, he wants to he wants to be the best. And he, we always talk about different strategies, how to be the best in here in strength and conditioning. And he's a big guy on developing guys. And I think uh, he has done so much for me as well, and as well as strength and conditioning here at the University of Colorado. Um, how many um, do you, well, do you have assistants or interns that help you or do you do it all by yourself? No, whoever says they can do it all by themselves, they are lying. Um, I have assistants and I hire a lot of people that are a lot smarter than me. Uh, and that's how you get better. Um, I know some people, 
you know, they're like, man, you know, I don't know. They're really good. <laughs> That's what I want on my team. Right. I don't want means that think like me. I need people that uh, that can come in and teach me as well. We have a great strength coach for women's basketball and women's volleyball. Adam Ringler, he's also our sports science uh, uh, supervisor. Right. He oversees our sports science department here. We have an assistant named Tessa Mendoza that we uh, took from Iowa State. She is probably one of the brightest and up and coming sports scientists. We have uh, a strength coach, uh, Francis Stevenson, that runs Dow War for me, right? Uh, uh, and that helps me a lot because I'm the director of Olympic and men's basketball, so I'm on the road a lot. So I'm looking for somebody that has a voice, that has can can have their own opinion, right, and can communicate really well to me. And she does a fabulous job for me, Francis Stevenson. And then we hired a young man named uh, Skylar Rubicobble. Uh, he does our women's uh, soccer team, tennis team, women's golf team, and he does a fabulous job for us. And uh, I think uh, everybody has different, everybody on staff has different uh, qualities, right? Mm -hmm. And I think everybody can learn from everyone. And I, the thing I took away was I'm hiring somebody that is, is bright at what they do, but it also a great teacher and communicator. And not only a great worker, I want them to be great people. I think when we have that, uh, our staff is unbelievable. And, you know, Tommy, being from Louisiana, you just want good people around you. Right. That's loyal, trustworthy, and and will have your back no matter what, right? And I think the staff, uh, you know, we put together here is, is top notch. Yeah, and you said something that I believe so strongly in, and that is – you got to be great communicators. You got to be organized and you got to be hard workers. And, you know, you knit, you didn't say a word about programming. And nope. um, if you're not a great communicator and you're not highly organized and can't execute that program, those sets and reps and exercises and distances are useless. Don't mean nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Don't mean nothing, coach. You're hundred percent correct. Now, you know, you mentioned the Dow Ward uh, facility. Um, man, that took me back in time um, because uh, that's, you know, the EJ Doc Crease uh, weight man. room there that Doc, uh, you know, built so many years ago. So it's been a long time since I've heard someone say Dow Ward. And I don't know uh, if there's any presence there, you know, of his legacy, but man, you talking about a great coach and a great human being. There wasn't man, anybody the, better than Doc Crease. Doc Crease, I was at, I just got to, I left SMU, came to Colorado, and I'm at a conference. And I'm the, the reason I go to that conference is just Tommy's there, Heffernan, and he's like, I'm going to be in town. I said, oh, I need to go see him. So I go to the conference, and here comes Doc Crease, and he's like, You're at Colorado? I'm like, Yes, sir. And I know who Doc Reese is. I mean, he's a legend in our field, right? And I'm like, yes, sir. But, you know, we start talking. And then he's like, come take a walk with me. He gets me in Norma Tech boots, so I can't leave this conversation. We talk for about an hour. <laughs> <laughs> he gave me the ins and outs of Colorado, and it was phenomenal. I was like, wait, yeah. what? This is what you do? And he's like, if anybody tells you different, don't listen to him. I'm like, yes, sir. Because he <laughs> is the, you know, he was, you hear Doc Reese, and you're like, man, he was Every former player that comes back here at football and they talk about Doc Crease, it's amazing. They love him. Yeah. They loved him. They would yeah. run through a brick wall through, for him. Yeah. And when you're a coach and you can hear that passion, and he's not even there standing in front of us, right? Yeah. And I'm talking about these guys are like, I'll do anything for him. And it was, it's great to hear. And, uh, you know, uh, I know he passed away about a year ago or so. And, you know, I, I know his legend lives on here. Yeah, that is awesome, man. That is awesome. Um, so, you know, and I've, I don't, I told you this, uh, I don't have any experience, uh, in training basketball. I've seen a lot of basketball teams train and I've been around a lot of really good basketball strength coaches. Um, but I know there are some misconceptions that people have about basketball players and training basketball players. Can you talk about, uh, some of those misconceptions and um, the type of people. Uh, yeah, I think the I think the biggest misconception is, you know, they if you come from football to basketball, they're like, man, basketball, are they soft? Well, if you train them soft, they're going to be soft. Yeah. If you train them to be tough, they're going to be tough. And I think 
it depends what kind of coaching style you have, right? I know I have, we had some people walk through here uh, last summer and they were, uh, they came through and they're like, yo, what the heck is going on in here? This is like how football trains. And I'm like, man, this is how athletes train, right? Yeah. Now, bi biomechanic, that. yes, high level athletes, biomechanically, there are going to be some differences now, right? Between an old lineman and a basketball player. But again, there's going to be biomechanical differences from a receiver and a DB with long arms compared to mm -hmm. some like a running back, right? Mm -hmm. So we can get into that, to that, all that later. But I think the biggest misconception has always been that basketball, are they soft, Steve? Well, if I train them soft, they're going to be soft. If I let them cut yeah. corners, they're going to cut corners. If yeah, I man. let them, if I don't teach them how to build habits, and it goes back to either you're going to build your habits or your habits are going to build you, right? And I mm -hmm. think if, if if you build them up and if you hold them accountable and you are truthful to them, everybody yeah. understand, truthful to them. Listen, they might not like you in the beginning, but they're going to respect you and they're going to learn to love you. Because if they respect you, they're going to love you, I promise you, because they're going to come to you when something happens and because they know you're going to tell them the truth. And I think, and that's for any athlete. Amen. So if you're going to train them, if you're going to train them to be soft, they're going to be soft. But if you train them to be tough, young men and women, if you train them to be tough, if you hold them accountable, if you teach them how to build habits, if you teach them they can't cut corners, I promise you, they're not soft. Yeah, that's right. And that goes back to communication and organization and execution, brother. Uh, that got me fired up right there. Um, <laughs> and... You know, I and I've mentioned this on on a podcast. I think it was on one of these podcasts a couple of years ago. Uh, it could have been last year. Uh, it could have been last year. But uh, Brady and I went to go see LSU in Kentucky play in basketball, um, and we were close to the court. And usually. When I went to a basketball game, uh, it was because of a recruiting function or something yep. like that. And I don't have anything against basketball, but I was a wrestler in high school, you know, junior high and high school. So I just didn't have a lot of exposure to basketball, you know, mm -hmm. because of the sports that I chose. But I was watching LSU versus Kentucky, and, and it was as physical as anything that I have ever seen in my life. And there were some tough, nasty dudes out there taking shots at each other. And, oh, yeah. uh, it, I mean, you know, rough, rough and tough, man. So I believe you. Um, and uh, I think you are correct when you say that. Um, so you mentioned Nordboard and some of the other technologies that you use there. Yep. And sports sciences has some form of, of influence in just about every sport now in the college ranks. Can you talk about uh, the different devices that you use uh, and maybe some good examples of baseline data? And then how do you use that technology to drive the outcomes in your training and competition? Coach Moffitt, you just hit it on the point. How do you use it? I know a lot of people that collect it, but how do you actually use the data? We have Nord boards, we have the force frame, we have the force decks, we have the force plates, we have, uh, we, we use uh, uh, the don, uh, handheld denominator. We, we use a ton of, of, different, of different sports science. We have Connexon, which I think is a great company. Uh, Dillman, Coach Dillman told me to tell you what's up, but uh, uh, I'm telling you right now, everything we have is we use it for a reason. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start with Connexon. Connexon. You hear a lot about, oh, we overused the player. Uh, you know, oh, we, they're, they're doing too much. Well, what we found in the last two years, they're not doing enough. <laughs> they're not doing enough, right? They're not going hard enough, right? We did a case study. We had one guy that couldn't get in a very high uh, uh, accumulated load. Right. And we go into a game. We're playing Oregon. My man cramps, full body cramps. I look back at the two weeks of data. I'm like, yep. First year having connects on. I wish I would have had this a long time ago because I look at it and I'm like, well, he's only been in very high low for practice for uh, of a number of 12 in the yeah. last six practices. And then he goes out and plays 10 minutes against Oregon was at 84. Of course, you're going to cramp. I tell everybody yeah. it's like going on the treadmill, running at six miles an hour like this is easy. And on game day scoop that thing up to 20 miles an hour. Let's see how long you can last. 
Yeah. Well, hey, Steve, why why do you cramp? Because my man had 12,000 people in the stands. It was packed. It was going, it was crazy. Adrenaline and all of a sudden his body can only go too much, right? He was, he did his, everybody said, was he hydrated? Yes, he had his hydration. He had his, uh, the little formula a dietitian gave him. He ate correctly like he did all the time. He wasn't going hard enough. And that's what we've been seeing in the last two years. And that has helped me out for practices to go down there and say, don't take this guy out. Don't take this guy out. Keep him going, right? That helped. Now, Nord board, force frame, force deck, it's how you're using it, right? I use the Nord board for our hamstrings, right? If they have an asymmetry of uh, 10 to 15%, we have them in a category one, right? We're going to be doing different uh, different stuff for warm-ups for them, right? If they have an asymmetry of 15 to 20, we're going to be doing stuff during the workout to help that particular left or right side. Vice versa, if they're 20 or more, I'm calling the PT and the athletic trainer because that is out of my hands now, all right? I need help. Right. I need to go get help to help these individuals on the fourth. And that goes for the force frame as well as for the hips and adductors if on the uh, force plate. We use it as a readiness test. We also use it as a dynamic strength index test, which we use a counter movement jump or a mid thigh clean pull. But most of the time during the season, we use it as a readiness test. Right. Uh, are they ready? Are, are they ready to go? Right. Uh, was there RSI? Uh, the same as it was last week. Is it going down? Is the ground contact time going down or up? And that allows us to know, hey, like, are we doing too much in the weight room? Because to be a good basketball player, guess what, everybody? You have to practice basketball. Yeah. I've seen some guys that can squat 600 pounds and they suck at basketball. So you better play basketball, right? Uh, and I think that's why how you use the technology, right? How are you going to use it to benefit your athletes and everybody so different? Every every individual athlete is so different. So if you ever came in here for an in-season lift of mine, you're going to see about everybody doing something different, what they need to stay healthy and powerful throughout the season. And I hope everybody understands that. My hardest job, bigger, stronger, faster is easy for these dudes. My hardest job is to keep them healthy and eliminate inflammation throughout the season. I want everybody to understand that. We do that by doing a lot of, you know, force doing floor, force play jumps and making sure their their hamstrings are strong enough throughout the season, as well as their uh, mid thigh clean pool, and that allows us to help us to know what to do for the season. Right, and you know, I was um, I was at a clinic this past weekend, and I mentioned force plates. Uh, didn't talk a whole lot about sports science, or it was mainly just it was a very basic. Uh, talk about, you know, strength training in general. And, but I did mention the force plate. So after it, a coach very respectfully questioned me about the use of force plates. And did I think that they were important for strength and conditioning coaches and uh, programming? And I said, absolutely. And he said, but I know that I'm hitting uh, all of the exercises to develop the qualities that are needed for the sport. Why do I need to use the force plate? And the thing that I, <clears throat> I, I, I tried to get over to him and I think he understood where I was coming from is that that is only half of the equation. Uh, and you touched on it <clears throat> when you said that you use it to, for readiness and, You know, there are analytical aspects of the jumps and the raw data that tells you that whether, you know, eccentric time or ground contact time and all of that, when that lengthens, we have issues that we need to look into. And that is so, it's so good to hear you say that because it's the balance of all these things that you strive to, uh, to keep in check so that you know that you're putting a good product on the court come game time. And then as much of the travel that your teams do in the amount of time that you're away from your facility, uh, it's important that you have things like this to, uh, to gauge the stimulus, you know, when, when they're in the gym training, um, so that is awesome. Now, um, when you when you start grouping your players, uh, and this and and I'm, since you mentioned in season, 
do you put them in buckets based on what you see or do you individualize it even more? Uh, and, and for you, you know, I, you probably have 15 to 18 guys on, on the roster. So it's, it's a lot easier to individualize. I know, you know yes. for us and football string coaches, when you have a hundred and something of them, you strive to individualize the training, but you end up having to put them in three or four different buckets based on what you see. How do you handle that? Great question. I think, you know, I like the like buckets, right? You yeah. got the high minute guys, right? That are going to like your, you know, might be a eight rotation or seven rotations out of good high minutes. Out of those guys, you have the two to three guys that are playing 30 plus minutes, right? So that's going to be another bucket. Right. So we have one bucket that turns into two buckets because you have to understand, like, hey, basketball is offense, defense, and they're running a lot. And if we have an asymmetry on somebody or we have somebody that's getting weak, we have somebody that's uh, losing power. We have to develop that power. Right. We have to get it back. Right. I think it's uh, I think uh, Stu McGill said 10 days, 10, I believe it was 10 days, every 10 days, you know, you want to keep that power you get a power workout in, right? And that's why we use our BBT system called Output Sports and make sure we're in the right fit, right speed zone of, of what we're looking to do, right, during season, which is usually our power phase, right? Uh, I think if we want to keep it between, we use meters per second, everybody. I know people are like, why don't you use peak velocity? I'm like, well, because I use one number because we use it through a whole year and I don't want to screw anybody up. So we use average velocity for each lift. I'm like, if we're in speed, I'm like, I want you above 1.0 to 1.5 if you can't get there drop the weight 10 pounds here or if you get above 1.5 add 10 pounds here and depending on what lift we're doing but again uh you have the, the high minute guys you've got the guys that play so they might be doing something different more probably more mobility than anything right and then you're going to have the guys that are playing 20 plus still need mobility but they need, they need more power okay because then i get enough minutes and then you have the guys that don't play but practice and then you've got the walk-ons and the red shirts so I got walk-ons and red shirts going to be with me three to four days a week in season. They got the guys that play but don't really see the court. They're going to be with me three days a week, right, because they're practicing a lot too. Mm-hmm. And then you have the, the high-minute guys, which develop into two buckets, and everybody's super different depending on what they need. Uh, that Yeah, good. That is awesome. You know, you said something earlier, and I was going to comment it, and I forgot. When you were talking about the reactive strength index and, um, and it, or, or, um, or DSI. Uh, yes. And so, um, you said, uh, y'all do a, uh, a mid thigh clean, clean pull. pull. <laughs> yep. And, you know, you would hear a lot of people say we do a mid thigh isometric hold or isometric pull, but I know your background in coaching and you're right. And you said, uh, so I was listening to you and when you said mid thigh clean pull, I knew exactly what you were talking about, but my mind started thinking about maybe the exercises and your training philosophy and where you came from as a young athlete all the way through your coaching career. So (laughs) that was pretty neat. So that leads us perfectly (laughs) uh, to this next question that I wanted to ask you. And can you discuss your programming philosophy for all season training? Yes. And what does a typical week look like for the team during the intense developmental phase of summer training that you're fixing to get into? Yes, I, I think, I, you know, knock on wood, everybody comes in healthy, no, you know, restrictions on axial loading or telephomoral syndrome or anything like that. Everybody comes in healthy. There, there is, I always say this, we're, we're going to learn to knee bend. We're going to carry heavy stuff. We're going to learn to pull correctly. We're going to learn to press correctly. I get this a lot. But bench press is bad for your shoulders. Yes, it is if you do it wrong. 100% is bad for your shoulders if you do it wrong. But so is running if you run wrong. So is walking. So is driving. If you drive wrong, State Farm is going to drop you one day. Okay. So if you don't teach them how to lift correctly, 
right? And none of this matters, right? So I think every day we go four days a week. We do it. We do a, a two day split: Monday, Tuesday, off Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Wednesday is a hot yoga day. Uh, I do hot yoga for two reasons: one, for some flexibility and mobility, but another reason, mental. Okay, it gets hot in there. I have our instructor Joe Marshy crank that thing up. Humidity. We act like we're in Louisiana. It's about 98% humidity. We have it cranked up to about 97 degrees the first day. And I want to see who, who can actually control their body and let their body know that you're in control of your body, right? And I promise you, we had about two to three guys each year, like, I can't do this. And they walk out, right? And I think that's when they, but they finish out the, uh, the summer with this for high yoga. But I think it's, for me, uh, we can do mobility anywhere. For me, the high yoga is more mental for me. I think uh, we're going to push our guys on Monday. Uh, we're going to learn to, we're going to learn to bench press. We're going to press. Okay. We're going to, we're going to learn to control the weight. Tuesdays, we're going to squat. We're going to teach them how to squat. We're going to teach them how to deadlift. We're going to teach them how to do a single leg Bulgarian. All right. Thursday is our, I love our Thursday. It's a team, uh, do a lot of team stuff. It's called EDT, escalating density training. And it is, uh, it's based on, you know, percentages and it's based on uh, work capacity. We get 15 minutes or 20 minutes, depending on which, how many, how much time we have that particular day. We pick three exercises. Usually it's a, it's usually it's a press with two pulls and we see how much weight, see how much reps you can do in 15 minutes. Right. And I think that allows us to get more work capacity because if we're moving up the percentages of 65% of five reps, each, each exercise we choose. And at the end of the six weeks or eight weeks, and we're up to 75% now, and we're getting more work done. I'm pretty sure our work capacity went up. And that's what sports is. It is a work capacity. Who can do more and who can stay, uh, who can stay at a at a phase of this doesn't bother me as much, right? And I think that's why uh, 100% why we do EDT, mentored by Charles Staley, great strength coach. And on Friday, we do our sled day. Uh, we usually do a Bulgarian uh, split squat, and then we go upstairs and we do our sled day, and it's competition sled day. And uh, each team gets to pick and we we go around the concourse and everybody's individually spread out. We team up. And if I, if team A touches team B, team B has team A's uh, sled. So there's consequences on losing. Just like in life, there's consequences on losing. So uh, we come across and it teaches them how to work together and it teaches them how to hold each other accountable before the season even starts. So when they come through adversity in the season, they already help, they already had some conflict with their with their teammates. And yes, people got caught before. And yes, they weren't happy about it because they had to push two sleds with three people instead of one sled with three people. Oh, wow. I like that. Yeah. Teamwork. Teamwork and they're overcoming adversity and they learn to, uh, they learn to fail and then they learn to peel themselves off the ground and keep going. And I think that's important. I really do in, in any sport. Uh, and I know, it. and I know you were asking philosophy and it's like, man, I used to be a ground-based Olympic lifting guy. Right. And then yeah. you, you get to certain individuals that you're like, Hey, Steve, don't mess this guy up. And I'm yeah. like, Oh boy. Oh, I, yeah. You know? And I'm like, I don't know if he ever did any lifts before. And like, yeah. like, and we know we need him to play as a freshman. Right. And it's like, okay, I'm a big believer in hang, hang cleans. I'm a big believer in pulling from the floor. I'm huge on it. Right. But if he's going to get hurt doing it, no matter how much I teach him, if he doesn't invest in it, then it's like, you know what? All right, I believe in it, but I need something to benefit him. It's not about yeah. me no more. It's about him. And I think when my philosophy has changed over the years, I'm still a ground-based guy. But at the end of the day, it's what can I do to benefit these young men and women? Because if it's not, they might not be great at power cleaning with their long levers. But let me tell you yeah. something. We're going to clean pull. and We're going to do it correctly. promise yeah. you that. Yeah. And, you know, weightlifters uh, and the people who excel <clears throat> in that sport are much shorter in statute than yes. uh, the, the bodies that you work with. And I completely understand that, especially if you have uh, somebody, even somebody that's 6'3", 6'4", 6'5", they struggle getting into a good snatch stance. And that's why we never did any snatch pulls or snatches Same. from the floor 
my entire time here at LSU because our tall guys struggled getting in position to do that. And there were times where we would raise the bar up to them. And then I said to myself, why would I do that? Why don't we just do, you know, hang snatch? And uh, so, yeah, like even racking the bar, you know, a lot of times when guys can't effectively rack the bar, people will sit and crank on their wrist and do all these things. But it's not a matter of – sometimes it's a matter of range of motion, but sometimes it's just because the guy has limb length discrepancies and his arm, his upper arm is so much longer than the lower part of his arm, it can't yep. reach that position. And there's a lot of you factors see. that come into that. And you have to do what's best for your team. And and uh, the body types that you train, so that's yeah. I I respect your honesty in that. Um, You know, I have a friend that. Well, so for instance, someone uh, I was talking about how I would train skill position players different than linemen this weekend, and I mentioned doing more front squats uh, and unilateral movements with. skill position players versus linemen and somebody questioned me on it. And, um, you know, your off season is time to develop the strength and power, but the closer you get to the season, the more specific you need to get to the demands of that position. And when you look at the demands of, uh, the position for a wide receiver, uh, the, the demands for uh, absolute maximum strength diminish and the demands of speed and power in, increase. And it's just, I don't see the purpose of, you know, skill position players doing heavy back squats, you know, leading up to the season. Um, I don't have a problem with back squats at all, but for a skill yep. position player, there are better modalities to use versus a 500 pound squat, you know, Um, which is, which is, we don't squat our guys heavy in season either, man. We do, you know, unless we have a big break during Christmas, we go back to it, try and get a percentage around 80, but usually we do accommodated resistance with bands. We do it to a box around 24 to 26 inches. If you're over seven foot, it's going to be yeah. around 27, yeah, 28. Seven foot. Yeah. 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 I, mean, I didn't I train some... any seven foot guys <laughs> ever. <laughs> I had quite a few so far. And then, you know, uh, what we found out was we started doing bench press like that as well. Like uh, more speed. And we did this about four years ago, started doing about four years ago. And at the end of the season, we started going back to our uh, percentage base. Hey, let's see what we can get for, uh, you know, 75 right now, right? And we found out that our 1RM didn't even decrease, actually was increasing because we were working on speed so much, yeah. you know, at least right once or once once, once every 10 days. Yeah. And it was, it was, it was, it was great for us to, to, to see that. And I think uh, when you were saying about their arms, Tommy, I got, we got a guy right now with a seven, three and a half wingspan. He, if he tried to do this, it would look so bad. Yeah. And it's and he's and people are like, is he flexible? I'm like, yeah, he's pretty flexible, but it's not his fault. He's got seven three wingspan. Um, is, that is amazing. A seven foot three wingspan. Yes, we had now a guy. The bar's not long enough for him no, to snatch it. No, so he looks funny sometimes whenever he's we doing an exercise and he's like, I can't look like you. The bar's too short, and I just start laughing. I, and he's dead serious. I swear on my life, he's dead serious. And it, it does look like crap because I'm like, what is going on? So I have to, I go get some PVC pipe, fill it up with uh, with concrete, and then he starts doing it a different way. Yeah. And I think we had one guy come in, and he was six seven with a seven foot one and a half wingspan, right? And he wanted to learn to power clean. And I taught this young man Tyler Bay how to power clean, and he went from one seventy six, right? Then he went to two 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 twenty. We had that man up to two seventy five. Right, power cleaning, and somebody said, Coach, his hips are too high. I said, He has a seven, two foot wingspan. His <laughs> hips got to be high when his arms are locked up. <laughs> and they're like, Oh, and I'm like, This is like, he doesn't look as good as yeah. a guy like five foot 10 that's locked in and has a has a yeah. short arms and short stature. So he looks locked in. 
and he looked funny but man was it beautiful when he got it up and the speed that he developed yeah. but he wanted to learn how to do that right and not everybody's yeah. like how did he, he wanted it he he came in three times a week and said i want to learn to do this right and i think that's the difference like if you want to learn to do it then you got to get these young men and women to believe in what's going to make them the best right and i think mm -hmm. it, sometimes you gotta you gotta get them to believe like they want it get them to believe right get them to get them habits of coming in and wanting to learn it. Because once he saw the weight started going up, people are like, how is he doing that? Well, he comes in three days a week. You should have seen he's dunking on everybody. You should have seen how many more guys started coming in wanting to learn how to power clean. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Uh, historically, uh, basketball teams were always allowed in the off season to get together and, you know, and practice and do some things where football was not allowed to do much of that type of work. You know, it all it had to be all voluntary. <clears throat> but now the NC2A rules have changed and they're allowing football teams to and other teams, all teams really, to do more. Has that affected how basketball uh, practices during uh, the off season also? Are y'all able to do more than you were able to do before? Yes, I think it changed like four years ago, five years ago. So when I was at University of Hawaii, we were doing basketball, right? It was had to be individualized, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I still got my two hours, right? I still had right. my hour of lifting, my hour of conditioning, right? Or whatever I wanted to use in those two hours. Now we've broken down as basketball gets an hour and I get an hour, right? So that's when this great communication with the coaches was you're like, hey, man, we got to condition them, right? So or we got to get them. You work on some uh, like lateral, lateral speed, lateral shuffles, yeah. what we want to do today. And I'm like, well, why don't we turn it into a drill instead of making it like instead of making it such like four corner drills or right. using ladders or something? Let's let's move it into a basketball drill so they have to be in a defensive slide and work faster. Right. right? I think that's where yeah. communication comes in. Right. Like we talked about earlier. And again, basketball gets an hour and I get an hour. So you you have to make sure you and the coaches are. are team are, are in line with what time we're lifting what time we're practicing what are we doing before practice volunteer like the, the guys to warm up and what are we doing uh afterwards right because that is voluntary right we can't hold hey you can't come in here right like it's voluntary do you want to get you know warmed up an hour before 30 minutes before because once that clock starts that's the time we have right yeah but people are like why don't you use your time to warm up right the guys well that takes time number one Number two, if you want to build habits, if these young men want to go to and play professionally at any level, overseas or in the NBA. I promise you, you better learn to take care of your body. You better know how your body works. And I think that's where we do a good job here because it's like we don't, you know, you line up everybody on the line. They could be going, you know, you know, half acid, right? And you could be yelling at them. But here, I like the way Coach Boyle sets this up. Hey, Steve, they want to warm up with you. They got an hour before practice to come warm up with you. They got all the way up to that time, right? And when we get there, I think the the guys that actually made it to the playing pro, those are the guys that know know knew how to take care of their body, right? And it's funny at the end of the year they come up to me and they say, you know, they're playing wherever they're playing. They're like, yo, that helped me out so much because when I got to the NBA, when I got to overseas, they're like, hey, we're going in thirty minutes. Now I knew what to do. I wasn't looking at other people. I knew exactly what to do for my body. Yeah, because a lot of people probably don't know this, but uh, as a strength coach and a, a sport coach, you're allowed two hours a day during the off season to train. And, uh, you know, you get four days during the end season, but during the off season, you only get two hours to train. So if for me, if football wanted, you know, to take that time, I, I was out, uh, if football wanted two hours to work and do drills and skill work, then there was no strength training taking place that day. Yep. And if, uh, you know, in many instances, we had to break that two hours up where I took an hour and the coaches took an hour. I took an hour and a half and they took 30 minutes. But the NC2A controls all of that type of stuff. They do. Um, how does your end season, and you touched on this a little bit, uh, earlier when we were talking about your programming philosophies, et cetera, how does in season training differ for you than off season training? And how much does travel affect what you're doing during the in season? 
off season, in season, totally different. Like I talked about off season, I'm trying to build their habits. I'm trying to get them stronger. I'm trying to build tendon strength. There's a lot of different, you know, very, you know, very how you want to do it. Right. But at the end of the day, time under tension, eccentric work. You want to do that. You you need to do that if you want to get their tendon strong and not get tendonitis, or if they had tendonitis by transferring the way, how they we have transfer, how much transfers we have now. They, a lot of guys come in with severe tendonitis. So they never know how to take care of it, right? So you have to teach them how to take care of it. Time under tension, eccentric strength, right? And that's when the program could be different than a guy that is healthy and ready to go because they've been with me for two to three years, right? That's why we have different programs. When when they come in, like you come in here in the summer, you're like, what the hell is going on? We do a DSI test with a kind of movement jump, right? That tells me what kind of phase are they in. Do they need concurrent training, strength training, or power? We have one guy from Germany, unbelievable strength, six foot 10, put four or five on his back. and He can squat all the way down, all the way up, beautiful form. What he was lacking was power. So he came in, he was the only one doing power. A power workout the whole six weeks. People are like, why is he doing that? I want to be doing that. Well, you can't because you're weak. That's why. Yeah. Right? Then and you show them their numbers. In season, I'm telling you, Tommy, my hardest thing is for how do we decrease the inflammation? I'm telling you, that is it. That is and I think when you have somebody that has a connects on chip and they're over a thousand for two days in a row and they come in and it's time for them to back squat, I'm like, woo, we're gonna do some mobility, some recovery modalities you're out and then you're gonna have somebody that's like hey coach oh, i want to do what uh this guy's doing i'm like well go practice hard because the way we're gonna win is practicing hard i, I don't want to in inflame his body even more because i just seen how it's very high intensity he was going to do that in the weight room regardless and now i'm going to do it twice to him i'm like no we need to do recovery for you my man you need it yeah. you need to get right okay and i think that's where in season is totally different than off season and it's different than everybody which we talked about earlier and that's why we use different uh, sports science uh, devices to help us out and to make the right call on that instead of guessing we're getting right now. Yeah. So when you talk about tendonitis, you're talking about um, knee tendonitis or jumpers knee patellofemoral. Patella tendonitis. Most of the, yep. Yeah. Patella tendonitis is what we see a lot of. Yeah. Jumpers. Underdeveloped quads. Yeah. Yeah. We got a new, uh, we got a new piece of equipment in here, Tommy, you would love. It's, it's called E-Gym. And we got the leg extension and we got the leg press on it. It's almost like having uh, weight releasers on the bar, but now you don't need four people, a spotter, two guys putting up the weight releasers. It literally, you can you can leg press it at 200 pounds and it's coming back at you around 450, depending on what your strength is. And it's it's pretty tough and you collect little coins. So it's a game, it's a video game for yeah. these guys as well. It helps us out a lot. Yeah, So and you use that for eccentrics. We do. Yeah, I mean, go try awesome. eccentrics. Go try eccentrics. Yeah, so, what's the, the name team. of it? What's the name e, of it? Uh, the uh, name of it's E Gym. E and then Gym. G Y. Okay, I'm going to look that up. That's something I yeah. haven't heard. That's what I like about my podcast. I'm telling you. It. Yeah. Yeah. You might, you know Silver Sneakers? You've seen Silver yeah. Sneakers, the YMCA? Yeah. So, yeah. Like, it was, it's this company's based in Munich. Um, my twin brother called me up and said, You need to check this out. So, I called him up. Just so happens that uh, the head guy is in. Colorado. So I was like, let me go check this out. So I check it out. And they actually put these in silver sneakers and found out that uh, the elderly patients were getting higher bone density and getting stronger. And I'm like, well, yeah, because they're doing eccentric strength based on their strength. Like yeah. if, if I leg extension, if I extend up, it's pulling me back down with a certain amount of weight, 50 pounds, seven, depending on what your max was on that machine. Yeah. And that's good. And you have to collect the coins. So you have to do time under tension on it to, to win the game. And um and it's been helping us a lot. It's a great Ooh, great product. I'm going to look that up. I'm going to look that up. Uh, let me ask you this: What about because I know that you've trained a lot of different sports and you're the director of Olympic sports there, both male and females. So, what is, is there a difference, or would you train female basketball player or women basketball players differently than you do men? Where do you fall in that spectrum? Yes, they have different anatomy. And what, and if you know the human body, you have to understand they have different anatomy, okay? And I think that's that's where it comes in to, uh, to what's better for male and female, right? You, uh, you read a lot of research on HIIT training for females and how much uh, 
uh, like better, better it is for them. Right. Compared to like, Hey, we're just going to go strong every single day. Right. You also have, uh, uh, Francis Stevenson is doing, uh, 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 menstrual cycle workouts. Right. So it, it is, it is so, man, it is complex sometimes yeah. of what she's, how she's training different female athletes. Right. But yes, it is different. Right. Not saying you can't coach them the same right. and hard. It's just different anatomy. And that's what people yeah. got to understand. Yeah. Uh, can you define coaching? Uh, yes. For me? <laughs> and what do you think are some of the traits, practices and habits of successful coaches and teams? Coaching to me is changing lives. I'm telling you, if you're at this level, getting any type of athlete that is can play at a division one level, right? I don't care what division, if it's division one, I am telling you, they have a gift, okay? And they're going to get bigger, stronger, and faster. We know that. Unless you have some kind of crap program that doesn't work, that's on you, okay? But if you do everything you need to do, know the human body, know how to use the sports science, know, know how to lift young, young men and women, I'm telling you, that's the easy part. Changing lives, getting them to understand habits, getting them to understand discipline, getting them to understand hard work, right? Nowadays you get, hey man, he was tough on me, man. I, I don't know if I like this. Do you not like it because I was right? Or do you not like it because no one ever talked to you like this before? And it's not demeaning, it's a coaching voice, right? I'm not yelling at you, it's a coaching voice, right? I'm never gonna disrespect an athlete um, because I have kids of my own. I would never wanna coach to do that either. But I hold my son and my two daughters to a high standard, right? But again, I look at them when their parents come in my office and they're like, hey, take care of my, uh, my son for me. Well, guess what? I think it's my duty, right? My, mm-hmm. my duty to say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, I got you, to hold them to a higher standard. And I think that's what that's what coaching is to me, holding your athletes to a higher standard, being disciplined, to them, teaching them habits, teaching them they're going to fail. They're going to fail at times. They're going to mess yeah. up at times. No one is perfect. Look back in the day. If there was social media, Tommy, when me and you were in high school, Ooh. I don't know if we would be right here. Right. Ooh. But <laughs> all I'm saying is they're going to mess up sometimes. It is yeah. our job as men in coaches to say, guess what? It's okay. What did you learn from that? How are you going to get better? How are you going to think about it differently this time? Right. And I think that's what coaching is. Coaching is changing lives. Bottom line. Yeah. Showing, showing them that you care enough about them to say, no, you can't do that. hundred percent. Why? Because I love you. Yeah. Instead of when I was a young coach, I would say, because I said so, or because the head coach said so. But, but as I grew older, you know, it's better that you, uh, and, and 99% of the time when you sit down with them and you explain the reason why you're doing it that way, kids go, Oh, okay. And that's all they need to know is that you love them and that you care about them and you want to be, you want them to be better from having been a part of your program. 100%. If you know the why, if you don't know the why, you better find your why. You better find out why. Because they're going to ask you, this is the why generation. Why are we doing this? You better have your why, right? But at the end of the day, once these young men and women know that you care about them and love them, that why is going to hit them harder than anything. That's why we drink vitamin C, for you. 100%. They're going to move mountains. They're going to run through walls for you. And they're going to respect the hell out of you. So when you say something, they're going to respect it. And I'm telling you, that changes the culture. Because when new freshmen come in, they're like, yo, this is how we, this is how we, this is how we do stuff in the weight room. We clean up. We don't let Coach Steve clean up or his interns. We clean up. We're going to, we're going to re-rack it. We're going to make sure the Buffalo's up. We're going to make sure Colorado, you can see. We're going to make sure we found it better than when we even came in here. We saw trash in here. We're going to pick it up. I'm telling you, when you start that culture and you can create it, it is a special thing. It is very special. I like that. Buffaloes are up. Mm-hmm. I like that's on the plates, huh? Plates, dumbbells, and we have we have a guy that's been with me for four years now, Tristan De Silva. And let me tell you something. 
he got so pissed off when the Buffalo was one wasn't up last summer. He said, "How many times I got to tell y'all? I'm just backpedaling. I'm like, this dude's six ten, yeah. right? Just yelling at everybody, and I'm like, good job. I don't. Yeah. This makes that's my cool, job man. easier because that's... I got them to believe in the culture. Yeah, and that's when at the very beginning we were talking about communication is more important than programming because when you develop a culture like that, the programming gets easy. The programming yes. part gets easy yes. when you have a uh, culture like that. Coaching gets easy, man. You just point them in the right direction and they roll. I, I learned right. something from Coach Boyle. Coach Boyle says, Steve, a player-led team is better than a coach-led team, and I've been Amen. coaching forever. He says, Steve, if you can get these players to be a player-led team, everybody's job's easier, Steve. Yeah. And I'm a big – and he's the first person I ever heard that from. Yeah. I've been doing this for a while, and I'm like, man, what? what? And that's yeah. when I learned, and they, he was he's 100% right, and I use it, and I stole it from him, and he's, he's 100% right. Player-led team yeah. is 10 times better than a coach-led team. Yeah. And and the and you develop that by having great leaders in place, and you know actions trigger feelings, like feelings trigger actions. And when they see you and your staff communicating and working together as a team and showing leadership, then the more people, the critical mass of the team evolves into the coaching staff. You know, it starts at the top. But then it grows, and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, man. That's all. Awesome. It does. It's like a it's like a big old, you know, cypress tree. You know, mm -hmm. next thing you know, you got roots everywhere, right? And I think, yeah. and that's from the former players coming back, the coaches talking. Yeah. You having the same communication, maybe they're not the same lingo, but the same communication, yeah. right? And if you have that, you should see it. It's it becomes a beautiful thing. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah so. Um, we some of our listening audience won't won't understand the uh, cypress tree analogy. Oh my! Bad. But uh, but I I know what you I know what you mean. Okay. Because I got a I got two cypress trees in my backyard, and you get those cypress knees up all over the place. So them knives be coming up. I everywhere. got you on that. That's North Shore. That's straight North Shore, right? There. North Shore, right there. <laughs> Um, so what advice do you have, uh, for youth coaches and young basketball players when it comes to strength and conditioning? Less is more focus on, focus on form, form, and form. You see on Instagram a lot and social media, people back squatting or, or, you know, oh, I can back squat this much. And that's how you get hurt. I can't tell you how many how many of my son's friends I get a call from their parents saying, can you help me? He hurt himself deadlifting. What? Yeah. What was, wh where was he at? Right. Then let me see a video. And you're like, Whoa, has anybody taught him? I think it's just form. It's yeah. working on the little small muscles, the, the hips, you know, that somebody, I was like, man, listen, if you can't do a body weight squat, what makes you think you're going to put a bar on your back? If you can't do a push up, perfect push -up, form yeah. push up, 20 of them, perfect form what makes you think you're going to be able to get a bigger chest bench pressing you're going to hurt your shoulders you're not strong enough right what makes you think that if you can't put a mini band around the top of your knees and, and your knees are still caving in what makes you think your hips are getting stronger like it's the little things that i think need to you know the youth and the youth coaches let's just teach them simple things very simple you don't have to go to instagram and be fancy it's the simple things how about a single leg squat before they back squat yeah you know it's the simple things and i think that's what we just need to simplify stuff don't be all flashy because i promise you every nba team every college team they do all everything what i'm just talking about with their warm-up and they never post it on instagram you know why because it's not sexy that's why yeah. mm -hmm. good deal thank you all right now here I wanted this to be the first question, but I made it the last. Um, and I think this is so cool, man, uh, that your twin brother is the head strength coach for the Washington com Commanders. Uh, it's a testament to y'all sneaking in Pelican uh, <laughs> when you were younger. Uh, and it, it also is a testament to uh, the influence that Kurt Hester had on you both when you were young kids. 
Um, so I think that is super, super cool. All right. Um, but here's my question. So the two of you com- uh, train completely different sports. One is a collegiate basketball strength coach. The other is an NFL uh, franchise head strength coach. Um, although they're different, how often do you two get together and share ideas and thoughts and compare notes about training and how you do certain things every day? Yeah. How cool. Is that? We talk every day. I was hoping. Every I was, day. Yeah. That is so cool. We talk every single day and, uh, he's my twin brother. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Kurt taught us a lot, but I promise you, my parents, they taught me hard work. Golly. My dad was a welder. My mom was a stay at home mom until we got this family of five, big Catholic family in Louisiana, yeah. go figure. And my mom stayed home. We lived in this little small house in Abita Springs. We moved from the West Bank to Abita Springs. And uh, man, I used to wake up with the smell of, uh, community coffee man and i'd be like man what's that smell or chicory coffee i'm like man yeah. three o'clock in the morning two o'clock in the morning my dad's driving to work so to see my dad work hard my mom yeah hard work yeah did your dad work at avondale where did he work at he worked in the union for a while and then he went to uh martin marietta yeah it was welding some uh tanks over there and then, uh, look, uh, recently he was at this little shop welding tanks again, right, like right next to our house. And it was funny. One day I was like, Dad, you need to stop welding, man. You need to stop this. And then I thought he was working at like a greeter at a bank. And then my little brother calls me and Chad calls me and they're like, yo, what are you talking about? I said, isn't that greeter at the bank? He told me he was going to go get a new job. They're like, nah, he just told me that he's still welding pipes. I'm like, yeah, I'll leave. You just do like to me. <laughs> But yeah. I'm tell you what, like I see my man wake up every day at two o'clock and then still come to our games at 7 p.m. Yeah. and wake up again. And he didn't get home to 930. And I'm like, my goodness, my mom did the same thing. Drop us off at school, rush to work, rush to get me. I mean, they taught me. I was in the eighth grade working at McDonald's and Chad was working at Wendy's. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Man, they did a great job. They did a great Appreciate job. Appreciate that. Um. Hey, great talk, man. Uh, Awesome to have you on here. Uh, I love your energy. Uh, I love your energy. And so I appreciate it. And I'm glad that I finally got somebody on here uh, for the sport of basketball. And, you know, we only talk basketball. And, you know, I I think – You know, having because I know that there's more to strength and conditioning than football. And I've coached a lot of different sports throughout my career. But most of the people that I know, my circle is all football strength coaches. So it's it's huge to have you on here. Uh, And and and, you know, whether it's football or basketball or wrestling, track and field, you know, the fundamentals are the same, man. It starts with having uh, great support from the head coach and the administration. Uh, communication is critical. Uh, like you said, you got to train uh, based on the athletes that you have and the sport that you're coaching. Um, so a phenomenal job, and I really appreciate it. I can't thank you enough for taking the time out of your day to come on here. Oh, man, I'm, I, it's an honor to be on here, Coach. Uh, Thank you. You a legend in this field. Uh, Chad worked for you as an intern, yeah. my twin brother. And, yeah. man, it, when I told him I was going to be on here, he's like, oh, you got to be kidding me. Are you serious? I'm like, yeah. He said, yeah. He asked hey. me before you, bro. And I said, and you yeah. work for the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Hey, that's that sibling rivalry. I know y'all got into some brawls when y'all were young. Ooh. Hey, the, hey, hey, win by two was never fun. We were all, <laughs> hey, somebody, hey, both of us coming in, bloody and black, black. And blue. Oh, man, that is so cool, man. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, you can follow uh, Coach Steve on Instagram at Steve, it, well, I'm sorry, it's at S N 
C underscore twin power, man. I like that. S N C underscore twin power. A, a lot of people think it's strength conditioning. It's Steven yeah. Chad twin power. Yes, yeah, Steven <laughs> Chad, man, twin power. That is so cool, man. That is so cool. This brings us to the end of today's podcast. Thank you very much for tuning in. And, and I'm telling you, man, this is one of the funnest that I've done because I know the twins and uh, I know them both. I've known them for a long time. And so this was super cool. Uh, please, if you haven't already done so, follow the podcast and share this episode with all of your friends. If you have any questions about the Moffitt Method, our training solutions for schools, uh, teams at any level, go to our website, themoffettmethod.fit, and check us out. You can connect us, connect with us uh, through our website, our social media accounts, or email us at info at themoffettmethod.fit. Uh, have a great day. Uh, man, I, I hope you enjoy this episode as much as uh, I did. And we'll see you again next week. Thank you.